One, two, three. Can you hear me? Good? Good. Yeah. So, guys, uh, self build versus uh, existing frameworks. Uh, we'll try to use, uh, well, we will use front end libraries and frameworks as an example during uh, our talk, but we will try to make it as uh, generic as possible. So, hopefully, we can also apply that to the frameworks and libraries in general. Uh, if you ever had a problem of choosing one approach over the another, uh, we, have, we hope that we also can help you to make a right decision. Um, but yeah, first couple of words about us, I guess. Cool. Updated introductions. Hi, I'm Julian Doucette. Uh, hashtag Julian and our on it. Hashtag Julian having look. Um, Canadian, full-time free and open source software developer. Um, I'm currently the websites module owner at IO and Adblock Plus. And before that, I helped prototype the UI of the next version of Adblock Browser for iOS. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Manuel, and I'm already like uh, three and a half years with uh, IO. And I started to work on uh, various uh, projects, uh, including uh, core, UI, mostly uh, UI. And also, I'm currently peer for uh, website module owner and uh, Adblock Plus UI. Uh, as a hobby, I also do like develop my own extensions and experiment with web. So yeah, let's move forward. Frameworks. So software frameworks is an abstraction that uh, provides a generic functionality um, and selected changes to it. A software frameworks makes it easy to build and deploy applications. If you are uh, trying to fix an issue, most probably somebody already came up with a solution. Maybe same solution, maybe similar. But there is, uh, most of the time, there is no need to start things from the scratch. So you just not need to re-implement things, but rather reuse. Just be careful not to misuse. The great thing about frameworks is that they are boosting your development speed significantly. But Sounds right, but uh, almost right. <laughs> but frameworks also have their drawbacks. Uh, let's consider a couple of them. You know what I'm referring to? I'm referring to the flexibility, not to the fact that Chuck Norris drive both trucks simultaneously. But yeah. So yes, you will be forced to respect frameworks limitation and works the way it requires you. What else? License. Even if it may not be applicable to most of uh, free and open source big frameworks, um, but actually it's up to the author of the framework or piece of code to decide about the license. So don't be surprised if the framework you are using changes the license or requires you to uh, reconsider the usage or adaptation. For example, I don't know, uh, switching to copyleft license. And our other thing. Uh, during uh, our hiring process, uh, me and Julian uh, did uh, notice that the most of the candidates who tend to use frameworks a lot during uh, uh, their development were, well, uh, they were lacking a basic knowledge about understanding uh, specific problems. So they would uh, rather solve most of the problem with the framework without understanding how frameworks actually solve that problem. So yeah, overusing frameworks may make you think framework rather to think solution. So are you the one who is in control or frameworks controls you? Awesome. OK, so we have a sense of who we're talking to here. Uh, maybe raise your hands up if your daily work relies heavily on third-party frameworks or libraries. Awesome. OK, now second hands up if you almost never use frameworks or libraries. Almost everything you do is self-built. <laughs> Only you? <laughs> cool. Yeah. I thought if we have React session. <laughs> oh, yeah, the React like session is back there. So we thought there might be a few more self-builders. Um, so it looks like we have, I don't know, 70% frameworks and 1% self-builders. That means that the rest of you may have been thinking something like this. 
requirements. So of course, static website is going to have significantly different requirements from a dynamic website, from a single page web app, from a mobile app, a desktop app, an extension. And you may want to align combinations of those existing libraries and frameworks, hopefully that don't look like this, with the problems that they solve and the problems that you're required to solve in your project, which hopefully don't look like this, so that you can make a decision based on hard facts instead of personal preferences. So yeah, what should we use? <laughs> which approach is actually better? There is no right answer to the question, because the choice is always dependent on the requirements. We actually can tell what are we using and how we are making our decisions according to our requirements. Um, there is something we tend to refer most of the time during our development process. Uh, I think, how, how else was it? I Reference think you called? called that common sense, Yeah, sir. common sense, right. That's what we are using as a reference a lot, common sense. This is what common sense looks like, by the way. <laughs> Before implementing something, we first check if we can solve the problem with a plain HTML and CSS. We check how frameworks and libraries solve specific problems. But Irregardless of the framework implementation details, we rely on official specification for implementation. And we are not saying that we are not using framework. And uh, I just wanted to fill the gap of no people raising my <laughs> 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 So yeah, we're not saying that we're not using frameworks, uh, libraries, or tools. But the thing is that uh, most of the frameworks, uh, tools, and libraries we uh, were uh, trying considering to use mostly overdoing the stuff. Uh, we start to use, for example, uh, bootstrap-like grid and strip it to four columns because all our layout didn't exceed that uh, limitation. Uh, so we used. Uh, some building tools. Uh, some of them are self-built. In some places, we use Gulp. Uh, we do also use preprocessors like SAS, but uh, we only use it for uh, components mostly and variables. So uh, we are using only the features that matters for us. When we're developing, we're trying to keep couple of key principles. Consistency. We do require our developer keep consistency, even if it requires more work. To ensure the consistency, uh, we do refer to coding styles we have created. Some of them are inheriting uh, Mozilla's uh, coding styles, some of them Google's, and we also add on top of it. Uh, that also help us uh, to be consistent during our development time. We also use linters to help, help us with it and also, also avoid uh, pointless discussion in the review. And yeah, and we're trying to keep it simple. Like, keep things simple is a hard work. Simple may also mean like using standards like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, as mentioned, rather than using ready libraries and components, which might be easy to use to but not simple to understand, for example, for other peoples. And yeah, we're trying to make no duplications. We don't want to end up fixing the same bug in 10 different places. Yeah, sounds good in theory, right? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, good key principles. Um, like you said, sounds good in theory. Um, but speaking of consistency, for example, across languages, um, some of our websites are in pretty rough shape right now. I'm not going to say that somebody wasn't thinking about these key principles when they put text inside of this banner or when they decided to use jQuery tabs only on the press page and include it on every page of our website. But I will say that we haven't completely avoided duplication. So I think we're still missing something here. 
And I'm going to use acceptableads.com as an example, because it's our most recent website. So this website landed on my desk sometime last year. Um, despite the project being already late, you've got to think, well, it's only one website. We've got about a month to build it. There's myself and a reviewer. And it's only 12 static pages. So long story short, I get a grasp of the requirements. It's about eight pages on launch day, actually, including a sign-up form. Um, two more pages the next week, including a second language. And we're planning a blog and a member section, but we're actually going to start on that a couple months later. So I carefully do the review the designs, doing the things you might expect. I actually want this design on a large desktop, a small tablet. The spacing here is inconsistent, and these colors don't exactly meet accessibility standards of contrast. Um, and I go ahead and I get a style guide from our designer. I implement a basic style guide covering the content, which I have the designer review. So apparently, this looks good. Cool. Furthermore, I build a fully functional prototype. prototype. Sorry. Now, this is for our content developer, because I want everything in this website to be able to generate from Markdown to our pages that I've seen so far in our designs and so far on track in the content, although it's not there yet. So pretty good, right? This is the entire website in a box. So I'm thinking we're pretty good to go. So still, because requirements are changing, the content isn't exactly ready yet. It has to be approved by a few more members of our team. And I'm noticing that I'm spending about as much time managing this project as I am implementing it so far. And I'm not really bothered by that, hey? As far as I'm concerned, under budget and ahead of schedule for development. You know, this is going to be the best website so far at I.O. Of course, these are some alternative facts. Um, despite my best intentions creating this style guide and this fully functional prototype, um, what I actually ended up doing was creating a website-specific framework that met requirements that were, in fact, still, be, still being changed. So as a result, the components you see up here were never actually used in the website that's online today. And they probably never will be used, but they're still in the CSS. Um, furthermore, some of the components that I showed you before ended up getting combined in ways that I might not have expected, e.g., this text probably shouldn't go on a green background. So come time for review. Here's what I saw. It's a work of art. It's a website-specific framework. It's minimal. Uh, but it just came in kind of a hard collide with some of the requirements at the last minute. But no big deal, right? Here's what my reviewer saw, Manuel, in this case. Uh, he saw a website-specific framework made up of several components that he wasn't already familiar with. So something definitely went wrong here. Um, if we want to talk about the minimum viable product or the minimum reviewable product, um, if we put aside issues that aren't related to the code, say the small deadline, um, you could argue that I put the entire building blocks of the website into review. This is arguably the maximum viable product at this point. And this review now is arguably the maximum reviewable product at this point. Um, and now we have the building blocks. We're putting pages on top of it. So I'm adding new pages for the final content daily. Um, keeping in mind that we only had a month, so two weeks in is half the time. And Manuel was preoccupied with project management for the first half. Um, the next lesson is consistency also applies across code bases. Um, I'm not talking about just the consistency of my little website framework or my class names or my documentation that I gave our content developer. I'm talking about consistency of code across our websites. Yeah, actually. Well all our websites are consistent, but it's each one is its own way. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> um, so finally, we also want to adopt new 
technologies gradually. And uh, for example, in this website, it was the first time we used SAS for one of our websites, one of our static websites. Um, I did clear this with you before, but uh, we agreed to restrict the usage only to features that were available in CSS3, like uh, variables and includes. So there's definitely something I did right here. Um, if you're learning how to develop and you're expecting something from design, the style guide, the layout that looks like that is actually pretty good. Um, in fact, some of the style guide went right. Particularly, the functional pieces. So that's pixels instead of EMs. That's how does spacing work, what elements do we support, and responsive images, for example. In this case, not floating images. I like your background. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so also, some of the layout. Manuel mentioned a four-column grid before. Um, like I said, we didn't need 12 columns that we can push and pull. Actually, we needed four columns inside of content because we always create a layout and then we have components inside the content. Uh, furthermore, the grid systems that were available at the time didn't by default support right to left or a concept of reverse ordering. So for those of you who are unaware, um, you might push a column back or push a column forward and pull a column back to reverse its order. But we we don't need to push it just a little bit. We always are flipping the order. So for example, here you have the second item before the first, left to right. And here you have right to left, where they switch and align differently. But when you bring it down to mobile, the first item always shows before the second. So there's also one of the components, which I'm not going to demo here today. Um, what I'm really getting at is there is a middle way between these two extremes that I'm talking about, where you have your overkilled requirements or your reviewer who hasn't used these things before that you may be overwhelming, and solving individual problems in a different way for every different page on every different website consistently. So if you think of a couple new requirements, um, in our case, we have four main static websites, but that also breaks down into about 20 websites across everything we use internally and externally. So we actually do want to share code across our websites for consistency, for maintainability, and for example, to document the decisions that we've made in code review. We also want to enforce some limitations, um, for example, on content, so that I wouldn't have seen a surprise from my components being used in ways that I didn't expect on design so that we know actually four columns in our grid inside of content is all we can do, and five columns tend to, tends to break our responsive layout. So we're documenting these issues that we've come across before by enforcing limitations. And then finally, lowering the cost of maintenance. Um, on a static website, when you're adding, when you're updating, maybe a developer has to get involved, maybe a competent content developer who also knows how do you work version control and markdown. So we also want to design some templates that even non-developers can use, even on a static website. And if we're going to do this gradually, we need to determine the minimum reviewable changes for our new websites. For example, that part of the style guide that worked could have been the first thing that went into review on the first or second day. Um, some of the layout components could have been the second and third. So you have content and you have a layout around it. And then finally, each of those individual components inside of content could go in their own reviews. And then you could catch, as you're going through the project and the requirements are changing, whether or not these are going to be in the end product. So step number two, you have all of these minimum reviewable requirements. And you know how to make them using the web platform. So you can plug them into that thing before, the requirements versus solutions matrix, and start adopting them incrementally. So you can use existing components to meet your requirements. And you can remix and self-build components to meet your requirements gradually. Thank you. Cool. Um, we don't know if there's a mic here, but if you guys have a couple questions, I think we have time. 
is there? <laughs> so, oh, there is. Yeah. There is a person who wants to ask. Uh, you could just repeat. Yeah, I yeah. need the mic. Ah. <laughs> Hi. So, what is the reason that you only use variables from SAS and not other features? Yeah, uh, we tried to hit on that. Um, basically, I had experience using SAS, but Madvel and another guy, Thomas, didn't. So, we wanted to use features that they already knew and that we agreed on were a good thing. For example, if we were to use maybe a loop that creates a new class every time and also uses the extend, we may end up with some selectors that they don't quite understand how they're working. So I want to use SAS for the reasons that it makes sense, but I also don't want to overwhelm my reviewer. Yeah, and also if uh, the CSS variable will get like a, a br browser support uh, across the browser and it would not make sense to use SAS as for only variables, we also can easily get rid of it and just use CSS variables instead. Yeah, so the long-term plan is actually to support the next iteration of CSS, but we can't do that right now because of our browser requirements. Any more questions? Raise your hand, please. Here is a question. Cool. Oh, you raised it just for fun, right? Okay. <laughs> Thanks <waving>. to this. <laughs> Any, anybody else? No questions. Here. It sounded like one of the reasons that you didn't want to use a full framework was that you didn't want the reviewer to be overwhelmed by something that they weren't familiar with. And that sounds like if a developer in a slightly larger organization wanted to use a framework, they probably wouldn't be able to. So do you think that the best way to implement a framework is a bottom-up where a developer decides to use it and tries to be an advocate? or you have to be top-down where management decides that they're going to be using a new framework? Good question. Yeah. Um, I had something on this. Um, so the reason I mentioned the matrix, not the movie The Matrix, the matrix that I put up on the screen, was because I think if you can demonstrate that your framework covers the requirements that you are going to have for the minimum viable product or the future product, and also if your framework or library is built in such a way that you don't have to include the entire thing, then that's when you can make the case for using the framework at the beginning, and you can teach your reviewer how to use it incrementally. Another question here? Or is it a joke? Real question. <laughs> OK, a real question. <laughs> Test. It works. Um, you talked a lot about CSS. Does this also apply to JavaScript, so to libraries like jQuery or whatever, or sliders or something like that? Yeah, I, I think it uh, applies to um, any framework that has some special underlying technology be, uh, behind of it. So uh, we also I am trying to do like progressive enhancement, like first like uh, thinking whether we can ach achieve the solution using just plain HTML and CSS, and whether if it's not enough, we check for a solution adding a JavaScript on top. Yeah. So I will add to that. Um, requirements also has to do with deadlines. So if you have a really, really tight deadline, for example, you may have to put those jQuery tabs on your press page. Um, and if you don't, you can implement it yourself. Um, the reason I use jQuery as an example there is that's a library that previously wasn't modularized. So if you use it, you have to use the whole thing. And if you have really harsh requirements on performance, that could be a problem. Again, it's getting back to the requirements, whether or not that is a problem. So you end up kind of changing or, or implementing just parts of jQuery, or, or how, how is it? Yeah, so ideally, we would. So for tabs, we could probably inter implement our own solution. But we would use part of jQuery if we needed to if the requirements said so. So that means we have enough time to review it. On one of our websites, we are using jQuery tabs. So as I say, it's, each website is consistent in its own way. So in one website, we are using jQuery. In another one, we are not using, because at that time, we use the jQuery UL. It, it sounds as like the most reasonable solution and way to go. But nowadays, uh, if uh, we have like implemented the uh, tabs that 
the way that we think it's kind of uh, better, covers all uh, the requirements that we need, we probably will not prefer to um, add jQuery on top of it. OK, thank you. I saw you. Other question in here? Hi, thanks. How does this apply to big applications? How does this scale? Because every time it seems to me like you're developing the same framework all over again, if you're not using uh, a built-in solution, a built, already built solution for it. Yeah, so that was kind of the point uh, where I actually did create the website framework over again, and that was the wrong thing to do. Um, so ideally, we do want to use some kind of, in this case, CSS framework. And it has to meet our requirements as close to exactly as possible. Um, so in our case, it was custom components for, example, the content in the grid. But in somebody else's case, in a larger application, it may be polymer components, for example. 